On behalf of River City Church, I want to welcome you to this uh, message, first recorded on March 22, 2020. Since COVID-19 is a global pandemic, uh, we are all in this together. We're in this situation together, this situation of uh, social isolation and distancing, the situation of uh, frequent hand washing and being careful, extremely careful with what we touch, a uh, situation with notices on stores and most restaurants and bars closed or only uh, serving takeout. We're all in this situation together, whether it's Canada or uh, uh, Germany or France. It, it doesn't really matter where you go. We're in this together. Uh, our lives being completely disrupted by this, uh, this virus. It makes no difference what your beliefs are or where you live globally. We are in this together. However, this week I had a deep thought, and uh, it's, it's not because I'm so wise or philosophical. Mostly I had this deep thought as a result of talking with you. Uh, as you can imagine, with everything that's going on, I've been having lots of conversations with people, people inside our church community, but also uh, in the broader community, uh, online, via telephone, via email, social media, all the rest. And um, by listening to you, this deep thought sort of started forming in my brain, and the deep, deep thought is this. Yes, because of this virus, we're all in the same situation. However, we're all experiencing things in different ways. For instance, uh, listening to Jeff Becker. Jeff is our youth director at River City Church. Uh, Jeff shared, and I should mention uh, Jeff and his wife Elise, they're in their 20s, they're young. Uh, Jeff shared that uh, his family is far less concerned about the health risks of COVID-19, and they're far more concerned about the potential economic uh, ramifications of this virus. Uh, Jeff is a teacher who's on the supply list, which means no school, uh, no paycheck. And so his fears relate far more to the economic impact of this virus than the health impact. Very different from people who are my age or maybe a little bit younger or a little bit older. Um, we've had decades to pay down our debt. We've had decades to sock away savings. We're young enough to not have to draw on our long-term savings, which is a good thing. If you're my age or about my age, your concerns probably at this time are more uh, around your uh, adult kids or your own parents. Our kids uh, are in the stage where uh, if they have employment, it's pretty precarious. Um, my daughter had uh, two part-time jobs and both jobs have let her go because they're not busy right now. And I'm hearing this uh, theme from, from many uh, young 20-somethings in the workforce. On top of that, our own parents are aged, uh, and they're in the demographic that's hardest hit by this virus. They're the ones greatest at risk. And on top of that, uh, in efforts to keep them safe, they're, they're completely isolated. They're, they're kind of housebound, either in nursing homes or retirement communities, so we can't even visit them. So if you're around my age, you have fears too, but they're more about your adult kids and how this is affecting them or your parents than it is about yourself. Now, I've also been hearing from seniors, and for seniors, the, the concerns uh, are both, both health concerns and e economic concerns. Uh, since seniors don't have any incoming income, they're depending on their long-term savings, and they're, which have been hit very hard, and so they're trying to withdraw as little as possible, hoping they can weather this economic storm, hoping that their investments can rebound and uh, be healthy again, but they're also in that demographic that's most at risk. And so seniors have a very challenging time on, on both fronts right now. It's a very sobering time for our seniors. Now these examples show that we're all in the same boat, we're all in this same situation, but it's affecting us at drastically different ways. And I haven't even talked about uh, kids or teenagers, but you can be sure that this is affecting them in different ways too. That was my deep thought, and when I realized this, I was like, I think that's something worth sharing, and I'm sharing it with you in part to encourage you to keep other people in mind, to try to empathize with uh, not just what you're going through, but with what other people are going through. Try to see uh, COVID-19 through others' eyes, and let's extend greater grace to one another and more understanding. 
We're all in this together. We're all experiencing it in slightly or drastically different ways. And to greater or lesser degrees, we're all experiencing a level of fear. Fear of, uh, uh, because of what's happened in other countries, fear of what's starting to happen here in Canada, and fear of what could happen uh, down the road. But what if we could replace fear with faith? Thinking out loud here, but how might your experience during this situation be different? How might it be changed if you could replace fear with faith? And by faith, I don't mean uh, wishful thinking. I'm talking about substantive faith, uh, what an investor might call a sure thing type of faith. I want to re reacquaint you today with a, a, a well-known story of Jesus. I say reacquaint because I think most of you have probably heard this story. It's the story of Jesus asleep on a boat during a storm. Jesus asleep on a boat during a storm. And I think more than maybe any other story, this story demonstrates Jesus' identity and Jesus' power. His identity and his power. And I could tell this story from Matthew's version, uh, Luke's version, or Mark's version, because it's recorded in all three of these Gospels. I want to use uh, Mark's version, because most scholars believe that Mark relied on Peter's eyewitness testimony. The disciple Peter is reporting this to Mark, and he's recording it exactly as Peter is relaying the details to him. Mark chapter 4, for those of you who want to follow along, and in a moment I'm going to pick up at verse 35, but let me first give you the context. Jesus is uh, just outside the town of Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, he's teaching and preaching, as uh, we read a lot in the Gospels, and the crowd has assembled around him, and it's gotten so large that he's literally forced into the water. And uh, I'm assuming it was one of his disciples, but someone offers him a boat. And so the boat is anchored a few meters offshore. And, and Jesus continues teaching and preaching from the deck of this boat. That's our context. And now from verse 35. That day when evening came, he, that's Jesus, said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side, referring to the Sea of Galilee. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat, and there were other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Let's pause there for a second. The Sea of Galilee is unique. It's unique on a number of fronts. First, it's unique because it's 680 feet below sea level. It's one of the few places on earth that's below sea level. And it's unique because it's, it's got hills, even small mountains, all the way around the edge. So think, think of a basin or a bowl. And then on top of that, you've got Mount Hermon to the north, which is over 9,000 feet high. And just to the west, you've got the Mediterranean Sea. And so as a result of cool air coming down the mountain and cool air coming off the sea, frequent storms, frequent sudden storms were not uncommon on the Mediterranean, on, on the uh, Sea of Galilee, sorry. And professional fishermen, like most of Jesus' disciples were, they would have been used to these frequent sudden storms. However, this storm that we read about in Mark chapter 4, it must have been incredible. Because here we have these experienced sailors, professional fishermen, and they thought they would die. They cry out to Jesus, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So how does Jesus respond? Mark records... He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So Jesus is awakened by his disciples, and two 
amazing things happen. Uh, the first amazing thing I would identify as his words. Uh, notice, Jesus doesn't make a big show of this. Uh, th there was no wand waving. There's no incantations. He's not shouting at the storm. He simply said, quiet, be still. That's it. I find the words Jesus uses amazing. And in a moment, you'll hear a little bit more why I find it so amazing. But even more amazing than the words, second, is the fact that the storm obeyed. The fact that the storm obeyed. At home, we have uh, two dogs. And when the doorbell rings, whether it's on television or at the front door, they go berserk. They start barking. And uh, I know they're just trying to guard their turf. They're, they're, they're guarding their people, so to speak. But I'm so embarrassed every time this happens. I just feel I cringe because I know there's company at the door. And uh, I just think they're going to think I'm a bad dog owner. I can't control my dogs. So typically when they start going berserk, I shout at them to stop. Surprise, surprise, right? It doesn't work. So I storm to the door and shout at them to stop. That doesn't work either. The only way I can get my dogs to stop is to take out this magic spray bottle and point it at their faces, and then, then they comply. Then they listen. It's the only way I can muzzle. By the way, it's only got water in it, right? But they don't like to be sprayed. So that's the only way. I can't even muzzle my dogs, and yet to a hurricane, Jesus simply says, quiet, be still, and it listens. Mark says, the wind died down, and the sea went completely calm. Have you ever seen water that's completely calm? Like I'm talking reflection calm, like where you can look into it, and you can see your face. When the winds stopped after Jesus' rebuke, the sea became calm as well. And that's not normal, is it? Any of you who've lived by the sea or uh, have visited the coast after a storm, you know that it doesn't happen that way. When a storm stops, when the winds stop blowing and the storm ends, the waves keep pounding the shore long afterwards. We're talking hours, sometimes a whole day. And yet when Jesus said, quiet, be still, not only did the winds die down, the sea became completely calm. That's the first detail of the story that surprised me. When I read that, instantly I was like, well, that's different, right? That's something significant. One point of agreement among ancient cultures is that the sea was this uncontrollable power and that no power in the universe could control the sea but the power of God. In ancient cultures and legends, the sea was a symbol of unstoppable destruction. The sea was full of fury. It was ungovernable, but by the gods or by God. Notice here, Jesus doesn't call on a higher authority. Rather, by his actions and his words, he demonstrates to his disciples and to us I'm not just someone who has power, I'm power itself. And if anyone or anything in this universe has power other than me, it's because it's on loan from me. Well, that's a mighty big claim. That's a mighty big claim. And if it's true, who is this? And what does it mean for us today? I think there are two options, and I'm borrowing this from Tim Keller from his book entitled Jesus the King. The first option is this. You could argue that this world is just the result of a monumental storm, uh, the Big Bang, if you will. We're here by accident through blind, violent, natural forces. And when you die, you return to dust. And when the sun finally goes out, as we know, from science, it will. There won't be anyone around anymore to remember anything that you've done. And so ultimately, in the end, it makes no difference whether you're a cruel person or a loving person. That's option one. However, option two, if Jesus is who he says he is, there's another way to look at life. There's another way to look at this situation we're in. If he's the Lord of the storm then no matter what shape this world is in or no matter what shape your life is in, 
you will find that Jesus provides all the healing, all the rest, all the power you could possibly want. Now, no detail of this story surprised me more than the next. Before Jesus calms the storm, his disciples are afraid. After he calms the storm, the text tells us they were terrified. At first glance, this, this makes no sense, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. It makes perfect sense that before he calmed the storm, they were afraid, right? I mean, they're professional fishermen. This storm is bigger than any they've ever experienced. The waves are coming over the gunnels of the boat. The boat is uh, beginning to sink. They're bailing to beat the band, and it's a losing battle. The boat is about to sink, and they're about to go down with it. So, of course, that's occasion to fear. However, the fear that they experience at the prospect of drowning is dwarfed by the fear they experienced after the storm stopped. Mark writes, they were terrified. The Greek is megale, mega from large. In fact, megale would be fear of the absolute highest order. Fear of the absolute highest order. They were terrified and asked each other in verse 41, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So how is it that the disciples are more terrified in the calm than they are in the storm? I believe it's because they realize that Jesus is as uncontrollable as the storm. Ah, the storm had immense power, right? They couldn't control it. It was throwing their boat around like it was, like it was a cork, right? Uh, but by calming the storm in the manner that he did, Jesus demonstrated that he had even more power immeasurably more power. And so they, in turn, had even less control over him. But there's a major difference. <laughs> a major difference. A storm doesn't love you. Nature doesn't care. Nature's going to wear you down. If you and I live long enough, eventually nature will wear our bodies down and we will die. It could be sooner uh, through the result of a natural disaster like an earthquake or a fire. But sooner or, later, sooner or later, nature gets us all. And you can say, well, true, but if I go to Jesus and he's not under my control either, if he lets things happen to me that I don't understand, he doesn't do things according to the plans that I have or in a way that makes sense to me, how is that any better? But if Jesus is God... He's got to be great enough to have some reasons to let you and me go through the hardships and the trials and the things in life that we can't understand. If Jesus is God, he's got to be great enough to have reasons to allow us to go through the experiences that we go through. His power is uncontrolled, but so is his wisdom. And so is his love. His wisdom and his love. Nature is indifferent. COVID-19 is indifferent. It doesn't care. But Jesus is filled with limitless love for you and for me. Quoting Keller, if the disciples had really known that Jesus loved them, if they'd really understood that he is both powerful and loving, they would not have been scared. Their premise, and maybe this is our premise often too, their premise that if Jesus loved them, he wouldn't let bad things happen to them, was wrong. He can love somebody and still let bad things happen to them because he is God and because he knows better than they do and he knows better than we do. Uh, Keller makes an astute observation about this story of the storm. Now, throughout the Gospels, uh, if you read the Gospels, then, then you'll agree with this. Throughout the Gospels, uh, we often see the disciples screwing up, right? And when we, when we see this, we kind of laugh at them. They're like, well, how could they be so stupid, right? But we don't feel that way in this story. In fact, in this story, we sympathize with the disciples. I mean, there was a storm. Jesus was asleep. They're about to drown, and so they panic. They were thinking, Jesus doesn't love us. And he woke up and, in effect, said to them, if you knew how much I love you, 
you would have stayed calm. And that's nearly impossible, we think. We, we know that we can't handle storms that well. In reality, though, we have a resource that Jesus' disciples did not have, a resource that can enable us to stay calm on the inside even when storms rage on the outside. It's this. Mark has deliberately laid out his story in chapter 4 in language that's parallel, almost identical to a well-known Old Testament story in the book of Jonah. Both Jesus and Jonah were in a boat. Both boats were overtaken by storms. In fact, the descriptions of the storms are almost identical. Both Jesus and Jonah were asleep. And in both stories, the sailors approach the sleeper and they say, we're going to die. And in both cases, there was a miraculous divine intervention and the sea was calmed. Further, in both stories, the sailors then become even more terrified than they were before the storm was calmed. Two almost identical stories, but one difference. In the midst of the storm, Jonah said to the sailors, in effect, hey, there's only one thing you can do to make this stop. If I perish, you survive. If I die, you live. All right, that's Jonah 1 verse 12. And so they threw him into the sea, which doesn't happen in Mark's story. Or does it? I believe Mark is showing that the stories aren't actually different. That when you step back and you look over them in the context of the rest of Jesus' story, they are more similar than you might imagine. You see, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, and this is chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus says, one greater than Jonah is here. And he's referring to himself. He's like, I'm the true Jonah. He meant, someday I'm going to calm all storms. I'm going to still all waves. I'm going to destroy destruction, break brokenness, and kill death. And you say, how can he do all that? Well, he can do it only because when he was on the cross, he was thrown willingly, like Jonah, into the ultimate storm, the ultimate waves, the waves of sin and death and hell. Jesus was thrown into the only storm, the only storm that can actually sink you and me, which is the storm of eternal justice, of what we owe our Father God for our wrongdoing. And that storm wasn't calmed until it swept Jesus away. Listen, if the image of Jesus bowing his head into that ultimate storm is burned into the core of your being, you will never say, God, don't you care? Related, if you know that he did not leave you to perish in that ultimate storm, what makes you think that Jesus will abandon you in this much smaller storm or these smaller storms that we're currently facing? According to the end of the story, uh, not the end of Mark's story in chapter 4, but the end of the scripture story, one day Jesus will return. And on that great day, he will still all storms for eternity. Between this day and that day, let that image of Christ on the cross penetrate to the very core of your being. Let it remind you that he loves you and that he cares. And because of his victory over sin and death and hell, nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate you from his love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the highest storm overhead nor the deepest waves underneath, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Uh, we're so glad that you made time to join us online and we would hope that you enjoyed today's message. We are doing church online and this is going to be different for us. 
River City existed in our community due to a number of faithful financial partnerships. And during this time, while we are not gathering together, we really need your support to give online. Please go to our website and to find some of those online giving options and consider making a gift today. Maybe you are brand new here with us today. Thank you for tuning in to this message. We hope that we'll see you back here again next week. We would love to get connected with you. Email info at rivercitychurch.org. Share a comment about today's message and let us know how you are enjoying our messages. Furthermore, I uh, just want to encourage you to look for more posts on our Facebook site and on our website throughout the week. You can find ways to do worship. You can do things with your kids. You can do things with small groups. Church may be going online, but we sure are getting together. So thanks for joining us again, and we look forward to seeing you next.